And they took up a position on our left, parallel to our course, and we headed together towards the Rhine. As we made the turn at Wavre, a bright yellowish light off to my left caught my eye. I could make it out. We were flying in bright sunlight. But it seemed to be something quite, quite large and a golden color. In 1972, I took my wife and our two daughters on a motor trip of uh, Europe. And we, went, we were headed for Brussels to visit friends. And we stopped at Waterloo. And there, on a high pedestal at Waterloo, is the British Lion, huge and gilded. And that's what I saw when, when we made that turn. So here we are flying towards the Rhine, and it took over four hours for the formation to pass a given point on the ground. Here's the Rhine River, and here's the town of Vesel, and that's where we crossed. And as we crossed, standing on a hilltop watching us was Winston Churchill, his daughter Sarah, General Montgomery, and General Simpson. Next slide. This is before takeoff. These are my passengers. And this is uh, Captain Bates of uh, headquarters checking our load. You see we're carrying artillery shells, anti-tank shells, and miscellaneous equipment. We met our passengers down on the flight line the afternoon before uh, takeoff, that the afternoon of the day before we, we took off. And uh, the first thing was to make sure that the cargo was well tied down and that the glider was balanced. A shift of as little as four inches in the center of gravity is enough to make the glider extremely difficult, if not impossible, to fly. So we, we did the weight and balance on that very carefully. Then I talked to these men. This was their first mission. And I was an, an old pro. This was going to be my third. And uh, I told them, what to expect in flight. I talked about flight discipline. And I let them know that, uh, well, things were going to go well. I had no, I had no fears of, of that. And then I asked if there were any questions. And this man said, asked me, can we smoke during the flight? I said, yes, once we're in the air, it's all right to smoke. But if you do, take along an empty tin can to use as an ashtray, because the floorboards of our gliders are soaked with gasoline, oil, and grease from the vehicles that we carry. And one thing we don't want is a fire in the air. He said that uh, he would use his helmet. I said, if we run into rough air, your helmet might be full. <laughs> this man asked, uh, what do we do if you're knocked out by enemy fire? He was too polite to say kill, knocked out by enemy fire. And I said, the co-pilot is fully qualified to get this glider down safely. It was only a toss of a coin that put me in the left-hand seat which was not true. I had the rank. Uh, but he persisted. And he said, what do we do if you and the co-pilot are knocked out? <laughs> and I said, if that happens, reach under the pilot seat where you'll find the manual on how to fly the Walker glider. <laughs> and I hope that at least one of you guys is a fast reader. <laughs> He had about 90 seconds before the glider would be down the ground. Next. 
Next slide. This is a familiar view on takeoff from Chateau Dunn, the Chateau of Chateau Dunn, the ancestral home of the Dukes of Dunn, one of whom in the 15th century was a comrade in arms of Joan of Arc. Somehow that, that, that pleased us. Next. This is the formation taken from the ground, double toe, uh, the, uh, the right hand glider was on the longer of the two toe ropes. And we still had difficulty keeping the glider separated because the tendency of, of the, uh, the Y toe rope was to come together. Next. This is on the run in. We saw evidence of the battles that had been fought as the Allied armies approached the Rhine. And if you look carefully here, you can see the shell holes. Here, along the roads, there were vehicles, destroyed vehicles. I don't know what town this was. Next, and this is the Rhine River as we saw it coming up on this, this loop, this curve here. And over here was the town of Vesel. And you see this? You see this smoke? That was a nasty surprise. And that came from two sources. One was the smoke generators that the British had, were using to cover their river crossing. And the other one was the action of British commandos who had crossed the river the previous night and set fire to buildings along, along here. And that smoke under the action of the south wind was, was blowing towards our landing field. Next. Can you make that a little sharper? OK. Here's the loop in the river. Here's the town of Vesel. And we crossed about here. And coming up, the first thing we saw was drop zone, which is W. W, right on the edge of this forest here. And their mission was to clean out the forest to make sure that no German artillery threatened the crossing of the river. However, the smoke from the burning buildings at Vesel had now covered landing zone S, where the gliders were supposed to land. This is the British here, and this is US. Here. So the first thing we saw was drop zone W, and that's in the next picture. These are parachutes, shell holes, and if you look very carefully, you'll see something that really made our stomachs churn. Empty gun pits. The Germans had pulled their guns back under the British bombardment. And they were obviously waiting for us up there. Next slide. That's a blow up of that same, same area. It's hard to distinguish. These, these are shell holes here, the dark ones. But if, if you look here, that's a gun pit. And this is the deer's ball. Next. The <laughs> Some of the landings were really fantastic. But would you believe the only casualty from this was the pilot's broken ankle? I don't know what, what, what happened here, but uh, Clearly, he misjudged uh, his approach. 
Next <clears throat> is another uh, man who hit too hard and broke the glider in half. Next, the Horsa. Again, the, the uh, nose wheels collapsed, the main gear is collapsed. You can see the smoke. Next. The Germans started using phosphorus rounds and the glider started burning. This one was burnt before this 57 millimeter anti-tank gun could be pulled out. Next slide. We had uh, 75 millimeter guns in action about five minutes after the glider stopped. This, as I said, was 17th Airborne, the 680th glider field artillery. The glider pilots did not sit around and watch the battle. We all, we had jobs. Most of us stayed with our passengers. If we brought in infantry, then we were just high-ranking infantry. And we had all gone through infantry training. Most of us at Fort Knox. If we brought in artillery, we served the guns. If doing nothing more than carrying shells up, up to the gun. We also were responsible for command post security and uh, crossroad interdiction. We had one fight that first night on the uh, other side of the Rhine where 115 glider pilots backed up by two anti-tank guns stopped the German armor column consisting of a uh, panther, a uh, half-track, and about 200 infantrymen from breaking through. It's known in glider pilot history as burp gun corner. The burp gun, or grease gun, was a cheaply made submachine gun that looked just like a, a lubricating uh, instrument. <laughs> Next, we spent the night in this farmhouse back here. And we woke up the next morning and we found this staring us in the face. But luckily, the crew had fled. Uh, we bedded down for the night in the farmhouse, not knowing that it was the Airborne's front line and one of their strong points. We went down to the basement and found uh, it had been set up as an air raid shelter. There was a large canopy bed and cupboards stacked with food and everything else. But there was no electricity. That had all been knocked out. So I found some candles and I lit them and I put them on the four posters of the bed. <laughs> Uh, a buddy of mine complained that it looked too much like a beer. <laughs> so I took one of the eggs out of the cupboard, threw it to him, and said, now he had an egg in his beer. <laughs> Next. These are uh, glider pilots of my squadron. I thought you'd like to look and see, see what they look like. We we're just about to get into these trucks and be driven back to the other side of the Rhine. Uh, John Schumacher had found a uh, German payroll office and was loaded with money. <laughs> when we rode in those trucks back across the pontoon bridges, across the Rhine, 
the glider pilots disappeared from military history, except for a handful that were used in the recapture of Corregidor, the island fortress in Manila Harbor, and an even smaller number used to recapture some Japanese airfields in northern Luzon. Gliders were never used again. The, those that were left in the States, all crated and ready for shipment overseas, were later sold for $75. And people were buying them for the lumber in the crates which was scarce during the war. The gliders themselves, except for the wheels and the nylon tow ropes, uh, which farmers found useful, were left to rot in barns, in garages, and out in the open field. So that when the National Association of World War II glider pilots decided to reconstruct one, it was very difficult finding parts still in existence. <coughs> At the next slide, this is from the official report on the Rhine mission. 1,625 aircraft were used, 92 were lost. 1,348 gliders were uh, sent out, and that's U.S. only. That does not include the British. And uh, you can figure that uh, about 5% of those were recovered in flyable shape. <coughs> we carried in 22, over 22,000 airborne troops and uh, almost 1,100 vehicles, 454 artillery pieces, and a lot of equipment. And you can see our losses here, too. Is that the last slide, or is there one more? That's it. I'll be happy to answer any questions. What distance uh, did you require to stop once you hit the ground? That depends on a couple factors. One, how heavily were you loaded, or more frequently overloaded? Two, what sort of, uh, of ground were you landing on? Soft ground, you could put the tail up, get the nose and the skids under the nose into the soft ground and, and uh, stop a lot quicker than you could on hard packed terrain. But most of the time, what happened was you find yourself rolling towards an, an obstacle at uh, 55, 60 miles an hour, and you didn't want to hit that obstacle. So you threw the wheel over, and you put the wheel into the ground, and you cartwheeled until you stopped. You tore up the wing terribly, but it, the, the people inside and the cargo was what counted. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't hear you. Yeah. Oh, uh, there was aerial reconnaissance of, of the landing areas. They knew it. <laughs> yeah, they knew it. But they didn't know, probably, the uh, French hedgerow was made of. Perhaps they couldn't tell that from, uh, from the reconnaissance photographs. But uh, all I can say is they should have known. The French resistance was in, in touch with uh, Allied intelligence. They should have warned them. But they did not always accept that information. That's very no true. They warned the British that there was a whole German tank division in the area, <coughs> and it was not accepted. So, I, I talked to you about the Bastogne mission. We suffered our worst losses, percentage-wise, on, on the Bastogne mission. Why? The 101st Airborne had radioed 
to uh, Allied headquarters that the Germans were massing northwest of the town for a last attack. The routing that we received from uh, Troop Carrier Command put us directly over the Germans. Now, what kind of uh, intelligence is that? <coughs> Not very uh, high percentage. Uh, mostly they shot at the uh, tow plane, figuring if they got the tow plane, they're going to get the glider too. The glider wasn't going anywhere without the tow plane. So they concentrated their fire on, on the tow planes. And the tow planes were vulnerable. I mean, they had no armor. They didn't even have self-sealing fuel tanks. Were any of the gliders salvaged and well, reused? Yes. As I said, about uh, 5 percent. 5 percent. Uh, my wife and I uh, went back to uh, southern France on our 25th uh, anniversary. We went to Monte Carlo, and we drove down to the Chateau Valbourge. And I was on a mission at that time to try to find uh, parts of gliders for our museum in uh, Texas. And I talked to people there, and they told me that the uh, Allied trucks had come into the area, disassembled those gliders that were repairable, and towed them out then took them out. You mean when I had the stabilizer missing? Well, yes, of course. <laughs> but otherwise, just normally? just normally? No, not a great deal of physical strength as such. More of a, uh, a touch a feel for what, what the uh, glider is doing. No servos, no servos. No servos, it was a straight cable connection. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what can you say about the quality and the weather information? <laughs> yeah, I was good, I, I, except in one case. On the night mission, the paratroop drop in Normandy, the plane the formation ran into a cloud bank that they did not expect. And the first thing at night, you can't see it. And they ran right into it. And <coughs> what are you going to do? You're flying in uh, Vs of three. Guys are right off, right off your right and left wing. So some planes went up. Some planes went down. Some went to both sides. Formation was scattered. And inevitably, the paratroop drop was scattered. When part of the stabilizer was shot off, was your co-pilot able to help you with the landing? My co-pilot uh, was able to help me. His name is Bud Klimek, and he lives in Lyme, Connecticut. And I kept yelling at him. After we dropped the rope and were made, trying to make our uh, approach, which was complicated by the fact that the group ahead of us had overshot the landing fields, realized their mistake, had come back, and were releasing their gliders underneath us. So we had to go down through them. I didn't dare make a left turn with that stabilizer missing. And I kept yelling at Bud, give me more spoilers which are air brakes on the top of the wings controlled by a, a lever in the cockpit. And this will give you drag and will slow you down and enable you to make a steeper approach at, at lower air speeds. But you landed in a I landed fine. Well, why didn't you show us a picture of yourself? Uh, why didn't you show us a picture of yourself? Modesty, pure <laughs> modesty. <laughs> <laughs> but I was going to tell you that I kept yelling at Bud for more spoilers. And finally he yelled back, he's got the lever in, the, in his lap. There are no more spoilers to be, to be uh, put up there. So I should have told him to stick his foot out the porthole and create some drag or something. But we, we came in fast, which, you know, 
you get lift off uh, off the stabilizers too, and with that gone, your stalling speed goes up. Sir, oh, I'm sorry. I want to tell you, you were talking about one of my war stories, and uh, on the morning of the uh, landing, uh, we were at the assemble point in. Uh, in southern England, and we were heading down towards Southampton, and they got us up real early, the convoys, and I could hear all this noise overhead, and just as the uh, sun came up, I saw your gliders, I saw the planes and the gliders, so that's, I'll never forget it, where the gliders, and I actually could see the men sitting in the gliders mm -hmm. in some way. Okay. Well, I must tell you, and uh, I'm a little ashamed to admit it, but when I was taken off the uh, mission list for Normandy, I complained bitterly about I went to the operations officer and said that uh, I've been training for this mission for a year and a half, and now you're going to leave me behind? And he said, it's not up to me. So I said, I want to see the squadron commander. He said, okay. So I went to see the squadron commander, and I complained just as bitterly to him. And he says, the list is made. We can't change it. I said, I want to see the group commander. He says, the group commander is a little busy right now. So I had to stand at the base of the control tower and watch my friends take off for Normandy. How old were you? I said, uh, in June of 44, I was 23. I heard a story about a general that flew in one of the gliders and they put metal plates underneath them. Yeah. When they released the tow line, the plane was being controlled and crashed and was killed. No, that was General Pratt. I told you that he was flying with Mike Murphy into Normandy at night and they had put plates around uh, his jeep to protect him from uh, anti-aircraft fire from below. But that's not what killed him. Not it was hedgerow. the impact. Not hedgerow. He, hitting that hedgerow was what killed him. Can you tell me more about the museum in Texas? The, the museum in Texas? Lubbock. <laughs> Just been moved to Lubbock, which was one of our schools. And I should tell you that uh, when the glider program was first announced, I was at the Army Air Force Officer Candidate School uh, in Miami Beach, Florida, having lunch with Clark Gable. <laughs> and uh, my orders were to report back to Randolph Field, Texas, which I had just left. And I wasn't going back to Texas for anything. And that's why I volunteered for glider pilot training. <laughs> why were you having lunch with him? Hmm? Why were you having lunch with him? He, we were both uh, uh, student uh, officers yeah. at that time. He is an awfully nice guy. Let me tell you, Clark Gable is a, is a prince of a guy. He, they kept pulling him out of formation for uh, photographs and interviews, and he hated it. He just wanted to soldier with the rest of us. And, but the Air Force had a prize, uh, publicity-wise, in, in, in Gable, and they milked him for, for everything. He was still mourning the loss of his wife, Carol Lombard, at that time, and uh, we respected his private grief. Hmm? <laughs> no, as a matter of fact, I didn't. I didn't. I, it, it would have been intrusive. Yeah. Really. You, you don't ask a fellow soldier for his autograph. He wanted to be a soldier. We granted him that. He went, he went when he graduated, he became uh, public relations for the uh, Bomber Command in England, I believe. And I started the first of half a dozen glider schools. How many missions did you participate in? Three. Southern France, Holland, and the Rhine. 
Oh, what time? What time? How long? Oh, we arrived in uh, in England the beginning of March of '44, and our last mission was again March the 24th of '45. In that period of time. About one year. Just about one year. Yeah, that's true. Incidentally, uh, I had two years of high school French and one year of college French. And when the squadron moved from England to France in the first week in September of 44, I found I couldn't understand a word <laughs> that the French were speaking, and they couldn't understand me. I had to start studying, studying all over again. Yeah. Yeah, oh. <laughs> yes. Uh, the definitive word on glider pilots was uttered by uh, under the following circumstances. When we arrived in France, we took over an ex-German airfield near Alençon in the department of Calvados. And that's another story. <laughs> uh, we barely had time to unpack before we were back in the air practicing for a new mission which two weeks later would turn out to be Holland. But it was fly out an hour, come back an hour, drop the rope, and land. And it's pretty boring. Except I started to have trouble in the tail uh, just before we made our turn to come back. And uh, I was concerned because of my experience in southern France. So I dropped the rope, and I started looking for a landing field, and I saw a, a beautiful thing. It was about at least two football fields long. I could have landed in it with my eyes shut. And when I got down close to the ground, there were no trees on the approach. But I noticed that there was a 10-foot high wire fence around it. And I landed and stopped and looked around. All I saw were some gray institutional looking buildings about a mile away. And then I saw an old man, dressed like a farmer, sitting there, clutching his knees to his chest and staring at me. And I went over and in my two years of high school French and one year of college French, I said, where are we? And he was so terrified he couldn't answer, but he pointed over my shoulder. And I turned around, and I saw there was a sign, which I hadn't noticed before. And I walked over, and I walked around, and I read, Asile des Aliénés, Insane Asylum. <laughs> now the wire fence and the institutional building started to make sense. And so did the old man. And when he got up, and started walking towards me, my hand slipped down to the butt of the Colt automatic on my hip. But he wasn't interested in me. The glider fascinated him. And he walked around the glider, and then he said to me, where are the engines? <laughs> and I said, there are no engines. This is a, c'est un planeur. This is a glider. I am a glider pilot, and I fly this machine against the bush. And he stared, <laughs> thought about it, and then in a sweet voice he said, you've come to the right place. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the latest word. <laughs> you've come to the right place. <laughs> now, he was probably right. He was probably right. The people asked me, Am I running over? Uh, people ask me, how did the glider pilots get away with, with such a lack of discipline? And I say, what were they going to do to us? Ground us? <laughs> Take away the joy of flying those flimsy crates through those terrible anti-aircraft fire? Deprive us of the fun of trying to land four tons of engineless aircraft? And any field we thought we could get into without killing everybody? I said, they couldn't do anything. I mean, if you're standing at the bottom of the deepest hole that a man can dig, you're a free man. You can't fall any farther. 
They couldn't afford to, to uh, ground us. They needed us. They needed us desperately. They kept telling to us we were going to get uh, uh, reinforcements. We weren't allowed to talk of replacement because that would imply that we had losses. But reinforcements were coming. I think they're still coming. <laughs> Any other? How long did you glide after you disappeared? After you dropped the rope, loaded? The, the big difference between whether they're carrying a, a load or not. If they're loaded, they have about an 8 to 1 glide ratio. So from an altitude of uh, 800 feet, which was usual, you could glide a little over a mile in any direction. You're gliding now? No, I've, I've been up with a friend of mine who has a sore plane, but I don't. I mean, uh, I've learned something in 57 years. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. What's the question? The uh, the cold dits, the cold dits, the uh, the German uh, prisoner of war camp, and they built a glider, in an attempt to escape. It didn't work, did it? Well, how did they get? How, how did they plan to to fly it? It wasn't powered. It wasn't powered. It was a hang glider. There's a good. There cold dits, if I remember, was on the top. A top of a peak, right? Yeah. They were going to glide over the barbed wire from the roof of the uh, barracks. Did they just take off from the roof that way? They never got that far. Is that right? They never. They uh, it and they tested it. It's in the Imperial War Museum. No. They built a model afterwards. Yeah, that's. Some of the individuals came back and. The, uh, the room was still there. Uh, the glider using their plans, and it did fly. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's what the, the... Whether it would have... They think it would have flown from there, too, but there was a, they were basically ordered not to, not to go out because they had, uh, the Germans were at the point where they were shooting people. And it, it, it was Mussolini was uh, arrested by the Italians after uh, the Allies landed in Italy, and he was imprisoned on a mountaintop. He was rescued by a glider, t German glider team. So, uh, yeah. However, However, the first use of gliders in warfare occurred at 3 a.m. on May the 10th of 1940, when nine, nine place German gliders took off from an airfield near Cologne and landed on the top of a Belgian underground fortress called Eben Mail, which commanded a river crossing and whose large-scale guns could have blasted any German invasion. Now this was the start of the German advance in the west that we call the Blitzkrieg and they had to cross the river at that point. So they sent 63 airborne engineers with new model high explosives to land on this 160-acre top of, of the, uh, the fortress and to blow the muzzles of those big guns and to confine the, the garrison inside, underground, until the German army reached them. It was brilliantly successful. I'm sorry to say it, but it was. Crete was such a terrible loss for the German airborne that Hitler forbade any large-scale airborne actions after that. He used them as 
super infantry, super, you know. Neil, you talked about uh, the taking the Gopher Brook Regiment into southern France. Yeah. That was only one company, the mm -hmm. Anatite Company. Yeah. We were fighting our way up to the Arno River at that time when they took the Anatite Company and made them glider troops. Al Allen was with the 442nd in uh, Italy. Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I wore less in combat. <laughs> Before you uh, leave, I'd just like to call to your attention again the books that are available, one of them being um, The Glider Gang, which you've heard some about tonight. And if you're interested, uh, check in the library with Karen Burnham uh, tomorrow. See if there's some of them that you'd uh, care to check out. They're available from various local libraries. We also had uh, one other item that uh, Frank Young uh, called to my attention. There is a program coming up about the, uh, the Band of Brothers. Uh, Jack Agnew uh, uh, spoke of the uh, Battle of uh, Bastogne, Battle of the Bulge, the, uh, the surrounding group. Uh, how about you? I'm uh, very active with uh, our group called the uh, Veterans of the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, we meet at the uh, Coast Guard. Uh, 